This is my Van de Graaff generator. Um, I've had this machine for a very long time. It's actually a composite of three different ones from different places that I've managed to pick up. Um, uh, one of them absolutely appallingly vandalised, but bits of it were okay. Uh, it's built by a company called WB Nichols in Scotland, um, possibly even in the 1950s. It may well be older than me, bits of this one, certainly. Uh, I was at a science teachers conference recently and this was the only one there. Well, unless you count a really tiny one, which was very, very impressive, but didn't charge like a bull like this one will when it's going. Um, I was going to run through cleaning it and sorting it and redoing the belt and all that sort of thing that you need to know. This one desperately needs it. It is filthy after a long season out on the road and it's got another one coming up. So I better make sure it works because I love my But hand even graph. though it's filthy and it's damaged, it will still produce some sparks. I do apologise for the sound quality now, it seems to be interfering with my phone a little bit, which is no great surprise when you think about it, um, but you can get in the work and you have no excuse for having a daft little machine that makes sparks just like you could get off a jumper. You can make them really make some sparks with a bit of help. And here's the bottom. Nameplate here, a Van de Graaff, a WBN Scotland generator, proudly on there. Uh, the column, as you can see, this is 3-inch Perspex. I'd love to change it, but it's uh, impossible to find. The domes themselves are made from spun aluminium. They would be the difficult thing to do if you were remanufacturing one, simply finding them. You have one made, it costs you a fortune. 10,000, probably a lot less, but who needs 10,000 Van de Graaff generators? You can see the lower comb, uh, once again, just wire, uh, soldered together. I, I've got it well earthed here. They will not work if they're not earthed well. You can see the drive belt here. This is one of the, the weaknesses of the machine. Uh, finding replacements is actually quite easy when you know how. This one is torn and actually goes that way, which is slightly annoying. It got caught, you know, it is f fatiguing. Um, cleanliness is important. When you replace the belt, like this, like many machines, modern machines, has uh, no tensioner for the belt. You have to do it by sort of dead reckoning. But that's okay, because at the end of the day, they are bendy, and they've got quite a lot of give in them. You can get away with quite a lot. Making sure that it's parallel is important. Uh, uh, this machine, unlike a lot of the modern designs, this is uh, enclosed, which is marvellous, because it means it keeps all manner of filth off it, um, which is good, apart from my fingers going eh, like that. Um, this is the belt that actually drives the machine. It's the, the, the little electric motor in there would be perfectly a place in a, in a 1950s sewing machine, to be honest with you. You don't really need a drive, uh, a, a drive, an electric drive. You could do it by hand crank. It would still work. It wouldn't make a lot of difference. Um, so, there we go. That's the base. Uh, I'll show you the next bit. Here we have the top end of the machine. Uh, you can see the belt pulley arrangement, the combs. The comb is uh, just a piece of wire soldered with uh, nails pushed through it. It is that crude. Some of them are knife edges, some of them are just little spikes. It doesn't really matter. Uh, should be arranged so that it's on the sort of downward side. So as the belt is leaving the pulley, you're picking up. This one will charge without actually a comb at all under the right conditions when it's working really, really well you'll see a spark jump from the pulley down to there. Uh, the bottom pulley is just perspex running on the phosphor bronze uh, bushes. This top end is, I've lined it with aluminium foil because I find you get the much better charge rate with the different combinations of the materials, which is in keeping with the tribolo electrification theory, I think. Um, not a lot else to say about it, really. Um, that is the top end. I'll strip it down, clean it, show you how to put it back together again. Um, the top. We have the belt, the uh, charge belt. You can possibly see these little bits of nastiness that have stuck to it there. They're where the belt's falling apart. It, it's just oxidising. Depending on what they're made from, they can go all stiff, they can go really stretchy, they can just kind of generally fall apart. I will explain how to uh, find new ones. Exercise belts are the way to go. They do vary in material a bit, so it might take you a bit of experimentation. But they So there we go. Uh, nice and shiny. Polished them off.
got most of the bits of dirt and various other bits of nastiness off them. Uh, they're not too bad, they're not too dented, so I'm not going to worry about that too much, but let's say you can just push them out. Scratches you want to try and reduce down in size. Um, a sharp blade's a good place to start for the protruding bits because it is aluminium and it's soft. And of course, because it's aluminium and I've been polishing it, I also have my, my hands here, which have got a beautiful colour of, well, metallic, frankly. Uh, it's just as well that... Uh, they don't think aluminium gives you Alzheimer's anymore, I think. I'm not sure about that. But uh, if it was, I'd be there, wouldn't I? All right, there we go. Now for the next So, bit. here we are, all shiny and the belt replaced. Uh, I cut it using a very, very, very sharp pair of scissors to approximately the right width to make sure it's not going to foul on anything. Then there's about a centimetre's worth of overlap. You can just see it in there. I used uh, a gel-type superglue to secure it and left it to cure overnight, and it seems pretty rigid to me. Um, it's all been cleaned with methylated spirits. The inside bits, you don't need to worry about the outside bits, they just need to be shiny. So, obviously, methylated spirits, don't drink it. Uh, wear protective gloves, that sort of thing. You don't want to absorb too much of that. It's not good for you. Um, and I'm just going to actually test the uh, function. Oh, I have reinforced the base, as you can see there, the bottom of the column, because this one gets moved around a lot, and it just seems a sensible thing to do, and that seems like a vulnerable part. It doesn't make any difference to the functioning of the machine. At least I haven't noticed. Um, here I have a digital um, ammeter, one of the cheap ones you get on the internet. It's connected between the top and the bottom. And when I turn the machine on, we should see some charge occurring. Yeah, there we go. That's not bad. But I can optimise it this way without getting an electric shock because I can actually measure the current. So if I put my hand in the top, I'm going to wiggle the top combs around until I get a better, a maximum sort of charge rate occurring. Oh, that's pretty good. That's very good. That's reading uh, about 5 microamps, which doesn't sound very much, but it is. The charge rate is determined by the width of the belt and how fast it's going, basically. Um, so if I turn it up, you see it goes up, turn it down again. This one I normally run basically at this speed. It doesn't need to go any faster to produce a lot of charge. The voltage is determined really by whether the electricity comes off or not. So if it discharges, the voltage goes to nothing and then starts to build back up again. Um, well, you can see it's uh, going wonderfully there. And it is lovely and shiny. So there we go, all put back together again. Nice and shiny, I hope you'll agree. Shininess is good, uh, little spots get, you lose the electric charge for you. If you do get problems getting one charging, then what you need to do is use one of these a hair dryer, you can remove a lot of the humidity off of the belt and, and etc and just dry the thing up, that helps. Um, here we have the ball on a stick, so let's put that there, we'll turn it on and hopefully we'll get some sparks. If I move the rod further away, then we get bigger sparks, up to a point. But over there, it's discharging, it's just going through the air, basically. But there we go. The Van de Graaff suitably sorted out. And uh, if you'd like to see any other demonstrations I do with this or anything else, have a look at my other videos. But in the meantime, um, thank you very much for watching.